All right. Um, thank you all very much for uh, for joining us today and Ryan's uh, Ryan Bio Network's second of what will be many webinars. Our series. Um, uh, apologies on behalf of Magali Haas, our CEO and founder, who is uh, on the way to the airport, as she often is today, and is unable to attend, um, although she might drop in later. Um, anyway, I will just uh, launch into the introductions here. Um, the, the purpose of this series is to foster an exchange of knowledge uh, based on the latest breakthroughs in a variety of technical fields, including bioinformatics, computational modeling, biomarker research, and nanotechnologies and we'll discuss how these can be utilized to accelerate the time to cure disease. In addition, we're inviting expert speakers to submit proposals for future webinars uh, on the above topics. Uh, the webinars will be 50 minutes long, 5-0, followed by a 10-minute Q&A with questions submitted virtually by the participants as we're doing here today. Um, all the webinars will be free and open to the entire community. Um, tiny bit of background, Orion BioNetworks is a relatively new Nonprofit dedicated to accelerating the discovery of better diagnostics, treatments, and cures for all brain disorders, not just MS. That's our pilot project. Um, led by CEO and founder Magali Haas, Orion is convening an alliance of partners from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors in North America and Europe. The alliance's goal is to harness the power of high performance computing and data analytics to discover and develop predictive disease models from integrated biomarker, biosensor, and phenotypic data. Rancho Biosciences, our host today, is a life science company leveraging open source tools and public domain data in pharma, nonprofits, and academia. The company's goal is to enable the life science community to take advantage of a wealth of scientific data by leveraging software and databases and developing open source platforms. Today's topic is the role of the gut microbiome in multiple sclerosis risk progression. Stephen Wicks, PhD, a scientist and data curator at Rancho Biosciences, will discuss a project that will identify enterotypes that are associated with, easier, with measures of disease susceptibility and progression. My typo, sorry. Stephen has drawn on both experimental and computational approaches to enable discovery throughout his career. He received his PhD from the University of British, British Columbia, working in the lab of Dr. Kathy Rankin. He then spent six years in the Netherlands Cancer Institute and the Hubrecht Institute of Developmental Biology in the lab of Dr. Ronald Plasterk, where he was involved in cell and molecular biology and genetic mapping methodologies. Stephen continued his work in his own lab as an assistant professor at Boston College before joining Rancho Biosciences. And if I've made any errors there, Stephen, if you would please feel free to correct me. And I thank you for, for putting on this webinar and throw it over to you. Thanks. All right, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, thanks to Orion Bionetworks and Magali particularly for giving me the chance to talk about um, what I've come to believe will be ultimately appreciated as one of the dominant forces in human health biology generally, and in particular, one of the major mediators of susceptibility of individuals um, to the development of autoimmune diseases onset and progression. Um, um, and relevant to what we're talking about here, today, particularly to MS progression and onset. Um, here we go. OK. OK, so the microbiome and MS. Um, I'm going to start by summarizing what I'm going to tell you. I, I find that helps. Uh, to keep things in mind as we uh, progress through the talk. Um, I'm going to start by, well, first of all, I'll say what I'm talking, what I'm going to do here is basically a white paper or literature review. Um, I'm, I did not personally conduct any of the research I'm discussing. I'm just going to talk about some ideas that have been synthesized uh, from the literature, They've germinating for maybe 20 years in the literature, but particularly in the last two to three years, there's been a real explosion of uh, results which support um, some ideas which have been around for a long time to the point now where I think uh, we're ready to start interrogating some of these ideas in clinical trials uh, and uh, I think Orion is well positioned to provide uh, the infrastructure and support for that kind of analysis. Um, the first idea is that uh, increases that we've seen in autoimmune diseases uh, related to patterns of medicalize are related to patterns of medicalization and migration and these are sort of um, public health policies and changes in uh, human migration uh, that are related to patterns of globalization. 
Um, I won't talk explicitly about this idea very much, but you'll see uh, that much of what is behind what I am going to talk about has its origins in this fundamental uh, concept that because we basically have undertaken a war on um, infectious disease uh, through widespread use of antibiotics and uh, due to patterns of human migration related to uh, the accessibility of uh, borders, um, we are seeing an increase in the rate of autoimmune diseases in our society. Uh, one of the uh, central concepts here is that the, home the, the human host uh, plays a role vis-a-vis um, -vis its interaction with the microbiome that uh, colonizes that human host. That, that there has been in the past this idea that there are good bacteria and bad bacteria. Uh, the history of the micro of the sort of the role of the microbiome in the human gestalt in uh, the medical literature, you know, 20 years ago was almost exclusively, even just two decades ago, was almost exclusively around the idea of infection. Um, some bacteria cause diseases, and we need to find out, you know, uh, identify those bacteria and find ways to control them to eliminate disease. And it's really only in the last decade that people have come to realize that. Um, that the, the larger bacterial population, which isn't necessarily uh, a direct cause of an infectious disease like typhus or salmonella or something like that, also has an important role in human health. Um, and uh, related to this concept of migration, we, we've we come to understand, and there, I'm going to present evidence of this, that the, we have underappreciated, for some reason, the extent to which the microbiome has evolved, co-evolved with the human host through migration patterns and globalization of, uh, you know, the, the spread of people um, has been accompanied by the spread of uh, diversity in microbiotic colonies within those people. Um, the third idea that I'll discuss is that the microbiome uh, impacts disease progress uh, within a variety of tissues. Um, yes, the idea that the gut microbiome can affect the health of the gut is not really a big surprise, although as I said, even just 20 years ago, this idea was a little bit out there because the focus was really on uh, infection rather than uh, the role of um, non-infectious general microbiota. Um, that I'll also demonstrate evidence that the microbiome impacts disease-related um, progression in gut-related organs, uh, and in this case I'll be talking about the pancreas and some papers that uh, show that type 1 diabetes can be modulated by the human gut microbiome. Uh, this is actually will be in an animal model. Um, uh, then following along that, the, from that work we will uh, see some evidence that um, uh, androgen circulating levels of testosterone uh, are uh, mediate the development of type 1 diabetes in the pancreas and so we'll look a little bit at what the mechanism of that might be and it turns out that the gut microbiota has pretty profound impact on primary sexual characteristics in rodents and um, because many of the autoimmune diseases that we're going to be discussing demonstrate a pretty significant sexual dimorphism that is females acquire these diseases including multiple sclerosis at a much higher rate than men do, and the mechanism by which that occurs is not clear, um, this is a potentially very fruitful line of thought that I'd like to pursue a little bit. And then finally, we uh, will talk about the brain and uh, the impact of gut microbiota on uh, inflammation in the central nervous system, again, in animal models. And what I'm going to argue is that the time is right for Orion to consider Orion or an organization like Orion to consider these ideas in clinical human populations rather than in animal models. The ideas um, are uh, uh, have a substantial foundation now uh, in the literature. Okay, so the gut microbiome. At this point in the talk, uh, people think about bacteria, but I just want to highlight that the gut microbiome consists of more than bacteria. There are lots of viruses there. Uh, and other organisms, including parasites, which can have an impact and uh, work hand-in-hand in hand with bacteria to produce these effects. Um, the gut microbiome is big. Uh, the, it's fashionable these days to talk about the gut microbiome as the, the newly discovered human, human organ or the overlooked human organ. Um, it weighs about the same as the brain. 
And I would argue that functionally it is as important to good human health as most human organs are, uh, that you can't live a healthy life without a healthy microbiotic environment. Um, and is one of the discrete, uh, many discrete microbial colonizations in and on the human body. Although we'll be discussing mostly the impact of the gut microbiome, people are beginning to look at the skin microbiome and its relation to uh, skin diseases like eczema or uh, psoriasis, uh, allergic skin reactions, um, uh, vitiligo and other autoimmune related uh, skin diseases, the upper and lower respiratory tract uh, microbiota are being considered within the context of COPD, asthma, and other uh, um, um, respiratory tract uh, related diseases, although I would not be surprised to discover that eventually we'll see connections between many of the mi microbial colonizations of the body and um, just general human health. That is, I wouldn't be surprised to find that lower respiratory tract bacteria also might impact autoimmune disease progression in the central nervous system. Okay, so um, right now I want people to just stop for a second and think about what they are. Think about your body, become a little bit aware of yourself, sit up straight, stretch your arms a little bit, maybe take a deep breath and think about what you as a human being are, what your place in the universe is. And well, here we are, we are human. We are uh, creatures of about a trillion cells. Uh, but the way I think about humans is basically we are a bag of connective tissue that holds together a very large, uh, overwhelmingly large population of organisms of which the human represents approximately 10%. The vast majority of cells on, in, and around your body are not human cells. They are bacterial cells. Furthermore, the functional diversity in the human genome is pretty amazing. You know, uh, we're looking at somewhere between 20 and 75,000 genes, depending on how you choose to define that word. Um, I pulled 30,000 down as a sort of consensus average from the literature. But the functional diversity in the bacterial genome, which we live with, is um, again overwhelming and rather staggering in nature. There are more than 3 million unique bacterial genes in the human microbiome, in the, yes, the, the metagenome of the microbiome which means, you know, I'd like to think about it this way, that if I get, give the bacteria in my gut all the raw materials they need, they could basically build the Eiffel Tower inside me. They, they have that kind of uh, uh, diversity, functional diversity, with respect to my humble human genome. So the idea that the gut microbiome doesn't have an impact on human health when faced with these kind of numbers, to me, is the staggering idea. The, the, it's kind of prima facie that the evidence is clear that these cells must be impacting my, my health in fairly profound ways since they represent most of what I am. Um, and so that's the starting point for where I set off to try and understand uh, what the role of this um, uh, 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 newly discovered organ, if you will, is in the progression of multiple sclerosis. Um, there are a couple of key MS observations which are well documented in the literature that are related to what I'm going to talk about today, and I don't mean to belabor this because I think most people on this call are pretty familiar with MS. Um, the first is the etiology of MS is complex, although we do understand that there is a fairly significant genetic predisposition, which is clear when you look at concordance rates of um, unrelated, related, um, monozygotically and dizygotically related twins. You know, the, the general uh, U.S. Uh, rate at which MS is, um, uh, uh, shows up is about one in a thousand people. Um, the concordance rate in monozygotic twins is somewhere between 0.25 and 0.3, but certainly not more than 0.4. So um, although genetics clearly does play a role in terms of progression, it is not a dominant role. Um, this is also clear when you look at the well-established uh, geographic distribution of prevalence of multiple sclerosis along with other related immune diseases. Here I've got type 1 diabetes in young children and they look remarkably similar to each other and there's a, a, a fairly, within the European population, a pretty clear uh, uh, gradient from what I would say is the southeast of Europe to the northwest of Europe. Uh, when you look globally on a larger scale and compare intercontinental differences, you see even more uh, clear uh, distribution. Now this 
distribution might be thought of as some initially uh, on first blush to be related to the genetic predisposition that I referred to. Uh, but when you look carefully at epidemiological data, at, uh, particularly in populations that have migrated from one part of the world, say a low uh, risk region of the world like Pakistan to a high risk region of the world like Great Britain or Israel, and there have been several studies with other countries as well, what you find is first generation immigrant populations maintain MS risk progression at the levels of their country of origin. However, their children born in their new host country develop multiple sclerosis at roughly the levels of the general population within that country. And this has been shown in several different studies. So uh, clearly this is not uh, uh, a reflection of a genetic predisposition. Uh, the thinking is that that there's some protective element um, in um, more equatorial regions or some uh, risk factor which exists at less equatorial regions which may um, uh, facilitate the progression of autoimmune diseases. Well, the next slide that I'm going to show you speaks to one possible uh, difference between these different regions of the world. And this is the uh, slide which relates the degree of medicalization uh, to uh, what we will call the prevalence of the autoimmune epidemic. That is, since the Second World War, autoimmune diseases including Crohn's, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, asthma, allergies, and many others have been on the rise, uh, some increasing more than three or fourfold over the last 50 or 60 years. However, at the same time, when you consider um, the progression of um, uh, infectious disease, you see that they have been dropping. So what's been going on? Well, a couple of things have been going on. Uh, with respect to this slide, perhaps the most uh, relevant is that there has been a, a war on infectious disease, uh, and the primary foot soldiers in that war have been antibiotics. Uh, since the Second World War, we've set out to eradicate polio and mumps, measles, hepatitis, tuberculosis, and others uh, through widespread use of antibiotics, and that has been a triumph of Western medicine. However, there are unexpected consequences. Um, the one that uh, probably most people have been thinking about is the development of antibiotic resistant strains of these disease uh, um, carrying organisms, which uh, is going to be a major challenge for Western medicine over the next hundred years or so. Uh, but the unspoken um, sister, or perhaps an acknowledged consequence of this war, I believe has been this rise in autoimmune uh, dysfunction because the same antibiotics that uh, act to eradicate the organisms that underlie these diseases also eradicate or largely clear-cut the healthy biota within individuals. The healthy biota which I think provide um, protection against the development of autoimmune diseases. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, three or four papers uh, which support the ideas that I've asserted early in this talk. The first of which uh, came out just a couple of months ago in PNAS. Uh, I think this is a profoundly important paper which is going to greatly influence our, st our understanding of how the microbiota interacts with uh, the human. Um, this paper from a group at uh, Vanderbilt University that's been working in Colombia in South America um, studies the interaction between uh, human hosts and Heliobacter pylori, which is uh, a gut bacteria which is present in around 70% of humans. Um, Heliobacter pylori is known to be one of the risk factors for stomach cancer. Uh, however, interestingly, the degree, the rate of infection of stomach cancer, uh, uh, sorry, of Heliobacter pylori within populations does not correlate with cancer risk. So some populations have high cancer risk, other populations have a low stomach cancer risk, and there's no correlation between Heliobacter pylori uh, titer in the stomachs of individuals and their risk for developing cancer. This group has been working in Colombia uh, because of a very unique mystery. Uh, these two towns, one here up in the Andes and one down on the coast of Colombia, se uh, separated by 200 kilometers, have um, a couple of differences. Uh, one is ethnic. The coastal community is largely comprised of people of African origin, whereas the community in the mountains is largely comprised of individuals 
with an admixture primarily of Amerindian uh, origin. The second interesting difference between these two populations, so close in proximity, is that the risk of developing stomach cancer in this population is about 25 times lower than the risk of developing stomach cancer in this population. And the reason for that, is, I think, is profound. What they show, what you're looking at here are basically admixture graphs of populations either on the coast or on the mount, in the mountain regions of the Andes of either humans or H. pylori. Um, blue in the human graph indicates uh, African origin admixture, so genetic background uh, derived from African ancestors. Uh, green represents European ancestors and the yellow represents Amerindian ancestors. And you can see in the coastal area the population is predominantly African origin, whereas in the mountainous area the population is predominantly Amerindian. Um, H. pylori um, spread with humans and seems to have formed four distinct uh, groups. Um, there is an African form of H. pylori. There is a, a two. There are actually two European forms of H. pylori. There was an Amerindian. There is an Amerindian form of H. pylori, but that seems to be relatively low diversity. And in most individuals in Amerindia, now do not contain Amerindian H. pylori anymore. It seems to have been outcompeted by the other strains. Uh, and there is an East Asian version of H. pylori. Um, oh, so what they did was they, they took samples, uh, biopsies from humans, and, and they looked at the H. pylori content and they tried to correlate whether or not a given H. pylori uh, was responsible for this uh, difference in prevalence in stomach cancer in these two populations. This is basically a summarization of their findings. Uh, of one of their findings. They, it, in individuals of African origin in the coastal villages who contain the African version of H. pylori represent a baseline in this study. They have a very low risk of developing stomach cancer. The Amerindian population whose gut bacteria are largely European have more than a five-fold increase in risk compared to people who live just 200 kilometers down the road on the coast. Again, the Amerindian version of H. pylori seems to have been outcompeted in almost all populations in South America. So here we have a version of the pylori which did not co-evolve in the Amerindian gut. And when you take the Amerindian, we look at the subpopulation of Amerindian individuals in the Andy Mountain Village, uh, the city I should say, uh, who happen to have the African version of H. pylori in their stomachs, their risk of developing subpop uh, that the risk of developing stomach cancer in that subpopulation is more than 25-fold increased over baseline. Um, the conclusion is that any study of gut microbiota has to consider the human genomic context, and this is why I think this is profound. The results that this conclusion uh, will have an impact far beyond just the study of stomach cancer, because um, as we'll see in the rest of the talk, the microbiota of the gut have an impact on human uh, disease progression in tissues far outside the stomach. Okay, um, I'm going to turn now to um, a model system called the non-obese diabetic mouse. Uh, the, this is the work of the Danska lab there in Toronto uh, at the Children's Hospital. Um, it, they were looking at uh, the development of um, a model of type 1 diabetes and uh, they're using this non-obese diabetic mouse. Now the nod mouse has a peculiar characteristic which is that um, after a certain number of weeks of development the mice begin to develop insulitis and eventually develop full-blown type 1 diabetes symptoms which include loss of um, uh, the islet cells, the beta islet cells in, in um, the Isle of Langerhorn in the pancreas. Uh, interestingly, there's a sexual dimorphism here which mirrors the sexual dim dimorphism we see in MS progression and the progression of many other autoimmune diseases in human populations. Females are more susceptible to the effect of the uh, insulitis than males are in this population. What the Dansk lab did in this paper, which I think is, oh, and I should say, the SPF here refers to specific pathogen-free conditions. So these are just general uh, animal housing conditions in most uh, research institutes. Uh, when you raise these animals in germ-free conditions where their food has been sterilized, um, 
the, this effect is abrogated. So raising animals in the presence of germ-free conditions um, eliminates the, different, the sexual dimorphism but does not eliminate the insulitis completely. What the Danska lab did in this paper that I think is really interesting is they did sequel transplants. That is, they took the gut contents of mature animals and transplanted them into juvenile uh, females to see if they could modulate the progression of diabetes, uh, so the progression of diabetic symptoms in this model. The black line here indicates the untreated female mouse again by 35 weeks or so, 80% or more of the population has developed diabetic symptoms. The red line shows us what happens when you take the gut contents, the small intestine is open, the cecal contents are removed from an adult female and transplanted into juvenile female rodents. Uh, those rodents develop um, diabetic symptoms at about the same rate as untreated females. However, when you take the cecal contents from a male mouse, an adult male mouse, and transplant it into a juvenile female, and then raise that female, the female develops diabetic symptoms that more mirror the male population. This was a pretty startling result. Okay, so sequel transplants from mature male NOD mice to female mice transmit resistance to the symptoms of diabetes. Uh, the Dansk lab went on to show that this was modulated in a hormone-dependent fashion. Okay, so this is basically a rec the, the first four bars here are just a recapitulation in another form of the previous graph. We have the control female, we have the female transplant situation. Uh, this is a control which I didn't show you earlier. Uh, they take the sequel contents from male mice and they filter all the cells out and just trans transfer the fluid which might contain cytokines or what have you. And that has basically no effect um, compared to uh, uh, a full sequel transplant from a male mouse. This last bar represents what happens when the uh, recipient mice are pretreated systemically with flutamide, which is an androgen receptor blocker. It completely uh, reverses the effect of the protection provided by the male sequel contents to the development of diabetic symptoms in this mouse. Okay, so with respect to this talk, this um, the main conclusion here is that the gut microbiota can modulate inflammatory responses outside the gut and uh, subsequent autoimmune disease progression. Um, the hormonal link to me was one of the more interesting results of this paper. And so uh, I, I'm doing a little work on the re research on that, reading about it. I found a, another paper which extends this result um, and shows that it provides a potential mechanism for this. Um, this was published last year in PLOS. Uh, probiotic microbes sustain youthful serum testosterone levels and testicular size in aging mice. Um, so this is yet another tissue distal from the stomach where uh, probiotic content, the, the gut microbiotic content and enterotype has an impact on, um, in this case, primary sexual characteristics of mice. They, I'm only showing a small fraction of the data from this paper. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but this shows uh, uh, testy weight in uh, they actually the study started as what they noted was that male mice that were fed human milk human breast milk developed larger testicles than litter mates that were on control diets and they did some work and discovered that a single probiotic bacteria lactobacillus ruteri in uh, the human milk was sufficient to produce the effect so these mice are all on the same diet one gets a control diet supplemented with a, a, a E. coli, the other gets a control diet supplemented with lactobacillus, and that alone is sufficient to produce about a 20% increase in testicle weight at seven months of age, which is maintained throughout the life of the animal. They looked at many, many other measures of uh, uh, fertility, including uh, fertility of uh, uh, circulating hormone levels, including things like the testicular Leydig cell areas. These are the cells that actually produce hormones. Uh, uh, testosterone in response to a luteinizing hormone from the pituitary gland. Um, these cells have a larger cross-sectional area, regard, uh, which is independent of diet, um, well controlled. The simple addition of lactobacillus will produce increased cell area, and uh, this is maintained across development, and this is reflected in circulating serum levels of testosterone. Um, at all ages. So um, simple addition of a single bacteria to the diet of an animal will more than quintuple or perhaps even an order of magnitude increase circulating levels of testosterone in that, in that male animal. 
These are highly significant results. Um, an interesting result, which uh, this is a bit of a feed forward slide because I'm going to talk about the cytokines and interleukins in, uh, in the next set of studies, but blocking uh, IL-17A recapitulates this effect. So, um, so here in this graph, we have a control diet. We have a control diet plus lactobacillus. Um, this is a, a sham feeding group, and this is the control diet um, plus antibodies to IL-17A. So this is systemic blocking of the interleukin 17A produces the same effect that adding lactobacillus to the diet will produce in terms of its impact on testy weight. Um, uh, and this is a cross-sectional area of um, the, the vesicles that, which connect the Leydig cells and uh, it is also increased by, uh, they, they measured all kinds of different measures of, of uh, secondary sexual, primary, sorry, primary sexual function in these animals and uh, blocking IL-17A uh, basically produced the same effect as adding lactobacillus to the diet. So with respect to this talk, the anti-inflammatory properties of uh, gut microbacteria can protect from age-associated testicular atrophy and subsequent loss of circulating testosterone. And since the Danska paper suggested that uh, circulating testosterone was, um, w was a, a link in the chain linking um, bacterial load in the gut to uh, inflammation in the pancreas, uh, it's beginning to suggest a sort of a systems level model of how gut bacteria might impact uh, inflammation in distal tissues in the human body. But the brain is behind the blood-brain barrier. It is all uh, protected, uh, right? No. Um, the brain is also su uh, subject to uh, inflammation as a consequence of altered bacterial load in the gut. And there are a wide variety of papers now which demonstrate this. These, these are just two that have come out in the last year, uh, both working with um, the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis model, uh, which I won't talk about in great detail because I'm not interested in whether it's a good model of multiple sclerosis. I'm just interested in whether or not um, it can allow us to determine whether or not bacterial load in the stomach has something to do with swelling in the brain. The answer to that seems to be yes. So the EAE mouse, uh, this is a, a mouse model of MS. Um, the basic model is pretty simple. Um, uh, you can uh, immunize uh, mice uh, and other organisms with CNS antigens, these are CNS autoantigens. So, uh, for example, antigens to myelin basic protein can be injected systemically. And about two weeks after that, you find measures of inflammation in the central nervous system. Um, and uh, the mice show phenotypes that mirror uh, MS symptomology in humans. All right, so here's the basic effect uh, in two groups, one of which was specific pathogen free raised and the other of which was raised in it with germ-free feed and environment. And you can see that about 12 days after immunization with um, uh, auto uh, CNS antigens, you get an increased swelling in the central nervous system of animals in specific pathogen-free rearing conditions, which is largely reduced under conditions when animals are raised in a germ-free environment. Um, these are just the actual scores of swelling and uh, the, the reason I show you this is that in the germ-free environment you can see that more than half the animals have absolutely no evidence of swelling in the CNS. They so get a, uh, an experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis score of zero. So it's a pretty profound effect. This is mediated via cytokine signaling and inflammatory cascades. Uh, they measured, uh, there are many lines of evidence for this that I'm not going to show in the interest of time. But um, I do want to show a couple. Uh, this is just to, to illustrate the point. Uh, IFN gamma, IL-17A, which we saw uh, in the testes paper, uh, both are elevated under specific pathogen-free conditions about eight days after immunization relative to germ-free conditions. Um, these are cytokines that are related to T helper, CD positive, uh, CD4 positive T helper uh, uh, one cells, which are the intracellular uh, response, uh, and that. Uh, T helper 17, which is the extracellular response, or one of the extracellular response pathways. Um, these are both pro-inflammatory cytokine signaling cascades, which are recruited by um, uh, 
uh, pa presumably pathogens in the stomachs of these animals. Uh, I won't say pathogens, I will say pro-inflammatory microbes. Um, and this was explicitly demonstrated when they reintroduced uh, a single segmented filamentous bacteria into the feed of these animals that largely reduced the effect of, um, uh, it, it largely restored the uh, 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 CNS inflammation in, in germ-free germ fed animals. Okay, so the results of this line of research is that gut microbiota can produce inflammatory responses in tissue far removed from the gut, even in the central nervous system. Um, so putting these findings together, we can begin to formulate sort of a mental model of how uh, the, uh, the makeup of the gut microbiota might be impacting um, the development of a disease, an autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis. Uh, the model goes something like this, where you have a balance of pro and anti-inflammatory biota, which can be disrupted by a number of factors. Um, most notably, over the last 50 years, the widespread use of antibiotics to treat inf uh, infectious diseases basically acts to clear-cut this population. Uh, when that happens, uh, weed-like populations erupt in the stomach, uh, very fast-growing um, uh, populations of bacteria which are generally pro-inflammatory. Uh, these can trigger uh, cytokine signaling, uh, cytokine responses in the cell which will lead to systemic inflammation um, in a variety of tissues. And there may be a direct connection between some of these cytokine signaling cascades and CNS activation of inflammation or there may be, and that, that pathway may also uh, recruit um, uh, a secondary pathway vis-a-vis -vis the uh, circulating levels of androgens and the two together seem to produce um, um, conditions under which you know uh, triggering a disease in those that are genetically predisposed to the disease or triggering uh, um, episodes where the inflammation becomes significant and you know we get uh, relapsing remitting uh, styles of disease that may be related to what's going on um, in the stomach. Now in order to produce a computational model of this ilk we're going to have to first understand what the players are. All of this data that I've been discussing has come from animal models and um, we're making a lot of uh, uh, inferences about what might be going on in the human. Um, so before we can produce uh, good systemic systems level computational models of disease progression, I think we need to first do the statistical modeling. Um, and so what we've proposed to do is to work with uh, Orion in um, the development of a statistical model of the MS microbiome. So uh, what we would propose is that in clinical studies that Orion um, provides infrastructure for is that we collect stool samples in addition to blood samples and uh, characterize the biotic content of those stool samples either through 16S uh, ribosomal uh, DNA signaling, uh, sequencing rather, or uh, metagenome sequencing. So just sequencing everything that's in there to identify uh, various um, protein coding regions, ORF abundances, uh, enterotypes, um, operational taxonomic units as the, is the phrase that, that is used, uh, which will feed into a multivariate analysis allowing us to identify um, the microbiome associated with uh, MS progression. Mm. Now there are a couple of wrinkles to this. One is the time domain. Uh, samples, uh, sample collection is a bit tricky when you're talking about um, uh, changes in the gut microbiome which might um, lead to, for example, uh, relapses of, um, of, of disease or uh, progression of disease. Uh, the other harkens back to the first paper I discussed with Heliobacter pylori and that is this information needs to be cast within the context of the human host. Um, so what we propose to do is to take the output of phase one of our analysis and uh, feed, in, feed that into a second analysis which incorporates information about the host, uh, the, the host human genome, either through whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing, GWAS, what have you, um, along with, very importantly, other clinical and demographic parameters. So how many courses of antibiotics has the person been on? Um, what, are, what is the hormonal state of the person at any given time? Uh, which might include things like testosterone replacement in men or hormone replacement therapy in women, uh, birth control, 
uh, other factors that might impact um, uh, circulating levels of hormones. Also very important, diet. So the nature of the individual's diet over time should be tracked. Uh, so that information needs to be collected and fed into this analysis. We'd also be interested in looking at biomarkers related to the pathways that we find suspicious from animal models, including the cytokine signaling pathways, IFNs, um, CD4 positive signaling cascades, etc. Um, all of that can be fed into a second analysis to ultimately produce what we think will um, be an informative uh, uh, list of players that uh, um, that will show up both in the MS microbiome, um, the MS metagenome, and the host, and the, most importantly, the interaction between the host genome and the, the MS micro metagenome within that host. Okay, so that's uh, coming near the end of the talk. I think we have time to uh, take questions. I'll turn off the, uh, the show here. If there are any questions. All right, here we go. Okay, a question. To get a picture of how questions in the gut microbiome are related to MS relapses, what, with what frequency would samples need to be collected? And are we able to adequately culture microbes outside the human body? Okay, so that's two questions. Uh, the f I'll take the second one first. Um, so whether we can culture microbes outside the human body depends on what population of cells you're talking about. Um, some, some cell populations uh, can be cultured. Some of the mi uh, microbiome populations can be cultured pretty easily, like for example ones that exist on the skin. Uh, but the gut microbiome is in some ways the hardest to tackle in this regards. Uh, there are thousands of species of bacteria in the stomach and more than 90 percent of them, uh, last I read, still can't be cultured outside the stomach. Um, so that is largely undiscovered country that we're talking about. Uh, it is, uh, the, the way these organisms are currently being cataloged is through whole metagenome sequencing. I mean, we're just basically taking stool samples and biopsy samples from intestinal tracts and um, uh, sequencing those directly and classifying them according to taxonomic unit, um, as opposed to sort of uh, culturing them outside the body. There has been some success with fermenters where whole populations of cells um, uh, are cultured in uh, um, a fermenter, um, you, sort of along the lines of, uh, you know, the way large populations of cells might be cultured for production of antibiotics or something like that. Uh, what's going on there is that probably there are sets, large sets of cells that form an enterotype that where any individual species within that set pr doesn't have all the tools to exist on its own. So they are concomitant co-symbionts in the human intestine. Um, so I hope that addresses the second question. The first question, uh, how frequently will we need to take samples you know, in order to get a good profile of what's going on? Well, that depends on the size of the study because if you have a large enough study, then you have enough samples at the right time by chance. Um, but of course, you increase the chances of identifying a correlation between, say, exacerbation of uh, MS symptoms and uh, a change in the microbiotic frequency if you take stool samples more frequently. Um, so I would argue as frequently as as is sort of logistically possible uh, would be ideal, um, but we'll have to um, see how the clinical studies shape up and uh, we'll be working with um, the other teams at Orion, you know, to provide input on that as needed. Okay, um, another question. Do you propose looking at the microbiome for answers or is there any interest in looking at cytokines and cytokine blocking agents as a possible approach to understanding the impact of the microbiome? Yes. Um, well, th the nice thing about the microbiome, sort of from a therapeutic 
point of view is that it's there has been some evidence in the literature recently that it's pretty it, it responds pretty quickly to changes in diet that it is possible to consciously mold the microbiome that you maintain through sy sort of systematic alteration of diet um, so that is uh, uh, that makes it a very attractive candidate therapeutically because if you can recommend lifestyle changes uh, based on molding the microbiome, which may, by the way, include things like like therapeutic interventions related to cecal transfer, uh, you know, capsules that will maintain bacterial populations through the stomach into the intestine before releasing them, or what has become um, sort of a, a grassroots movement actually among populations of people who suffer C. difficile infections, which is Clostridium, uh, which is really a horrible, horrible uh, infection of the lower uh, colon um, that leads to well severe dehydration, diarrhea. It is in some cases even a deadly infection that has been extremely difficult to treat with antibiotics. Again, because the antibiotics go in there, they wipe everything out, they de destroy all the bacteria, and difficile is one of those weed bacteria that pop up very quickly, opportunistically in environments like that, so they regrow. Um, uh, what people have been doing is fecal transplants, uh, basically uh, fecal transplants. They're taking poop from healthy individuals, purifying it uh, uh, in blenders in their kitchens, taking it back to the bathroom, and and doing enemas with it, and having absolutely fantastic results in the case of C. difficile. So. Um, fecal transplants is one of those things that uh, the FDA is beginning to eye, so it's not clear how that's going to pan out in the next couple of years as a potential therapeutic route, but um, that, that is an interesting approach to uh, modulating the gut bacteria in a way, systematically, that might promote, um, you know, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, 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 biotic environment, which will be useful for treating people at risk for MS progression or at risk for um, MS onset, uh, CIS onset, or what have you. Um, direct intervention via cytokines and cytokine blocking agents is, enough, is, is something that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is probably looking at actively now um, and might be interested in collaborating with Orion on in, in a, a study that looks at this sort of material. Okay. Uh, a couple other questions here. Metabolome. Will we be measuring the uh, metabolome in concert with enterotypes? Yes, yeah, so we do definitely want to look at biomarkers. Um, uh, as much as possible. Um, it's not clear yet. Uh, how much access we'll have to that kind of information, but that is that's an intriguing idea. Okay, and a, f a question from Stephen Larson: How can we transform the mental model you describe of how the gut microbiome affects the nervous system into a computational model? Well, once we identify the players that are involved using the statistical approaches that. Um, I've described, then you can start to think about making a systems level model where, you know, you model the, the, uh, uh, the, the compartments uh, of the various tissues separately and you, you have the input or output from each tissue um, to downstream or, you know, we, we network these compartments in a way that makes sense. Uh, so systemic, systemic uh, relationships would require that these networks be bidirectional. Um, uh, so you would be modeling specifically the, the gut uh, lumen, you would be modeling the gut epithelium where the interaction between, you know, uh, the probiotic and anti, uh, sorry, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory uh, signals uh, impinge upon the cells of the human for the first time and trigger cytokine cascades. You'd have to model the cascades, you'd have to model um, the relationship between circulating cytokines and inflammation response, inflammatory responses in target tissues, which would include both the central nervous system, and I would argue also would have to include uh, um, uh, the uh, 
uh, hormonal cascades of the male and female anatomy uh, and impact via uh, circulating levels of sex hormones in individuals. Okay, uh, if there are any other questions? We've got nine minutes. Maybe I went through it a little too quickly. All right, we'll give last call for uh, questions here since there don't seem to be any more. Going once, going twice. And there we have it. Stephen, thank you very much. That was a great, that was a great talk. Um, I, I learned some things I didn't know before. Um, but mainly, you are what you eat, right? Actually, I like to think you are what eats for you. <laughs> And be careful of shopping in aisle 17. I wasn't mm -hmm. quite sure what that was about, but um, but thank you very much. Um, we will be, be soon be announcing the date and time of our next webinar. Um, it'll be coming up in about four to six weeks. Uh, uh, but thank you all for attending. On behalf of Magali and Ryan Bio Networks, um, which is of course an alliance, and everyone here is a member of, of that alliance. Thanks, thanks again, and um, thanks to Gloria and everyone else who helped organize this. Um, we'll uh, we'll sign off now and uh, go on about our day. Right. Thank you. <laughs>